This week's episode is brought to you by Yesterday, Tomorrow, and Fantasy. Yesterday, Tomorrow, and Fantasy is an unofficial guide to the world beyond Disney, exploring the original stories and sources of the beloved films and attractions, alongside thought-provoking essays and other fun stuff. Plus, it is George and Jeff approved. You can find it online at yesterday-tomorrow-n-fantasy.blogspot.ca, or you can do .com. Either one works, depends on where you live. Well, hello, and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And, you know, just as a heads up for everybody, I have to give you a little warning that if you hear any weird noises like cars or birds or sprinklers or anything, it's because my window is open. This is what oh. we like to call life gets in the way episode. We don't <laughs> have any air conditioning in the house right now because it has to be turned off because we had a problem downstairs. So the window has to be open, otherwise I would die. Oh, I thought you were going to say, you know, paying attention to the sounds of cars, planes, fish, robots, bugs. I thought you were going with a Pixar theme. Mutants, monsters, you know, all those things. Monsters guess in college. Exactly. Monsters Partying. running businesses. Hey, that's the next one. That's true. That's right. Yeah, monsters running businesses. So, you know. think they'll do a monsters graduate school? Uh, no, they should do a monsters senior citizen home. Ooh, that's that's, that's just me thinking outside idea. the box. But now that they I said call that, it they can monsters P U monster. Because <laughs> well, no. man, that was kind We're, of rude. Let's not let's not do that. Yeah. Should we should we, we should, start? We should probably start. We should we should we should probably fly on out of here. Let's do that. It's time for Disney history. If you had wings open at Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom in June 1972, just eight months after the park officially opened. Now, the ride itself was sponsored by Eastern Airlines, who were the official airline of Walt Disney World from 1970 to 1987. This Omnimover ride, it featured travel destinations such as the Caribbean and many more. All of it were actually serviced by Eastern Airlines. And of course, in essence, the entire ride was a thinly veiled advertisement for <laughs> Eastern Airlines itself. Very, very thinly veiled. But I, like me, a lot of people didn't care about that. They really enjoyed the ride. Uh, the ride was actually free of charge, despite the park still using the ticket books up until 1980, and the wait was often less than a minute long, which to me is a pretty wow. spectacular wait time. Yes, it is, considering what's there now. So, Okay, well, Disney has a, has had a long history of teaming up with corporations to sponsor attractions, and uh, when it came to building Walt Disney World, things were no different. Uh, in 1970, United Airlines, who sponsored Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room at Disney, had their first year of multi-million dollar losses. And so, you know, Disney took uh, looked for another airline to sponsor a yet-to-be-determined attraction for the Florida Park. Eastern Airlines stepped in, offering a reported $10 million. It, of course, was a perfect fit, because Eastern offered flights to Orlando from more than 60 different cities. That's so a lot of cities. It's it's not quite as thinly veiled, or it's getting more thinly veiled. Yes, yes, it's yes, very on. thin. So Eastern was anxious to promote the exotic travel destinations that it also provided flights to, so WED set out to develop an attraction to help promote their services. Uh, there was a vacant slot in Tomorrowland that Disney wanted to fill, and it seemed to be the perfect location for whatever they would come up with. You know, they didn't have an idea yet, but they thought, hey, this is a good place <laughs> to do it for it, let's just throw it in this building. So, Adventure Through Inner Space, which, you know, the extremely popular ride at Disneyland, it provided a sort of prototype for what would become If You Had Wings, because both rides had many similarities, and since uh, both had Claude Coates as the principal designer. The attraction itself was met with a few challenges throughout its inception that Coates overcame. Brum. Peace. Sorry, you said Inception. <laughs> I know I had to. I was we like, have, wait, what was that? that a while. What was that? I was, like, <laughs> I was like, what's happening outside your house? I don't understand. Inception's happening outside Inception's my house. happening. Okay, so apparently Coates had some problems. 
and overcame them with ease. Anyway, uh, for starters, the show building itself was already confined to a set space of 28,000 square feet due to it being part of a larger building. Uh, it was surrounded by other attractions and shops such as Flight to the Moon and the Spaceport Gift Shop. Coates had to make something that would not upset Tomorrowland's pre-existing symmetry. Not synergy. Yes, symmetry. symmetry. Synergy would come later. That's why it became <laughs> Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> <laughs> so using these flat set pieces and sculptures and props and these film projectors, uh, Coates and his team managed to create a vibrant multi-dimensional experience to showcase the travel destinations of primarily Mexico, uh, the Caribbean, and New Orleans. The attraction also employed the first use of an effect called the Speed Room, which projected high-speed 70mm images all around the ride vehicles at all sides. Uh, this effect you can actually still see today in the Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger spin, the, the one of the last rooms where uh, Emperor Zurg's ship is like going back and mm -hmm. forth, and you know you you shoot it, and it's what you know what I mean. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, overall, the attraction had 41 16mm projectors three 70 millimeter projectors, of course, one for the speed room and two for the finale in the mirror room, 40 special lighting effect, proje effect projectors and one 35 millimeter projector. So many of the films used in the ride were shot in real life locations. Shooting took place in settings uh, like Acapulco, Jamaica, New Orleans, California's Imperial Valley, and many, many more. Over two dozen stage production shots were put together as well. These range from a full-blown Mexican fiesta to a casual round of limbo dancing on a false beach. But maybe not with false teeth. No, no, no Over false teeth are allowed on the false well, beach. It, it, it does seem like this is the, uh, uh, many other rides may have uh, been born from this one as well. Yes, yes, That we'll absolutely. see in a few years. So the, the theme for the ride itself was composed by Norman Buddy Baker, while Existentio wrote the lyrics. Now, Baker also adapted a piece of music uh, called the Airbus theme. Uh, Airbus, not Catbus. <gasps> Catbus. No, no, not Catbus. Oh, I got um, excited. Airbus, which was uh, from the Eastern Airlines commercials from that same exact time period. And Wed's sound effects department provided additional audio for the attraction. And some people may remember how loud the attraction actually was. <laughs> Because, like George said before, they had all those projectors running yeah. in there. And those projectors running, their films were extremely noisy, so all the music and the sound effects of the ride had to be turned up to 11 <laughs> in order to drown out the sound of the projectors. Okay, well, like we mentioned earlier, the ride didn't open on opening day because it wasn't ready yet. Go figure. Uh, it wasn't until late March 1972 that the blueprints for the ride's exterior interior sets were completed. Uh, the ride began to be pieced together at a frantic pace in California to be ready for the summer crowds in Orlando. They were shipped to Walt Disney World and installed in time for the attraction to open on June 5th, 1972. Eastern Airlines and Disney held a formal unveiling for the attraction during a dedication ceremony the following month, on July 2nd. Uh, despite not being featured in many of the promotional material for the park, the ride was a huge success with crowds. Despite being a massive advertisement for Eastern Airlines, it was still an extremely enjoyable ride that people remember fondly to this day. Now, funny enough, when you were exiting the ride, uh, you were informed that you did in fact have wings uh, by Mr. Orson Welles himself, and uh, <laughs> you could fly anywhere in the world, and you could do it right then and there as a matter of fact, because <laughs> Eastern Airlines had an information counter located at the exit which would allow you to book a trip right then, right there, as soon as you were off the ride. Go figure, right? Very, very convenient. So, Very convenient. Unfortunately, Eastern Airlines was bought out in 1986, and due to financial difficulties, they chose not to renew their 15-year contract with Walt Disney World after that. So Disney, faced with either shutting down the ride for good or trying to repurpose it, decided on the second option. So they closed down the ride on June 1st, 1987, and reopened it five days later, retitled <laughs> as If You Could Fly. Hmm. Very, very easy title change there. Hmm, I can see that. Maybe I have to change a few more keys. Just a few, but not Just many. Just a few. Just a few. So, Though uh, fundamentally the same ride, any mention of Eastern Airlines or its former sponsorship was stripped. While on paper it may not seem like much, uh, a lot of the charm of the original attraction was lost with Eastern gone. Many of the key props and sets were changed to take out Eastern, and even the theme song itself was adjusted. And because of that, If You Could Fly closed less than two years later, on January 4th, 1989. And not wasting any time, Delta Dream Flight, which was sponsored by Delta Airlines, they were the official airline of Walt Disney World, opened June 23rd in the same location. Huh, 
go so figure. What are the chances of that happening? Three airplane attractions in the same location. How convenient. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, Delta Dream Fight, as much as I enjoyed that also, that would also go away uh, when Delta dropped its sponsorship in June 1996. So the ride operated under the name Take Flight until January 1998, and then would close to make way for Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin. And though it's long gone now, If You Had Wings, it really was a much beloved attraction by many, many people, including myself. And a lot of the a lot of attractions that came later, especially in Epcot, owe some mm -hmm. uh, some nods to this ride. So even though we miss it, it still lives on in our memories and on the internet. And now on the show. Yeah, and and I guess I won the bet. W what bet was that? I didn't sing at all. You did not sing, and I'm very proud of you. And you know what? To ensure that you win this bet, I'm going to hit stop recording right now. He's a nerd. He's a, nerd. He's a, geek. He's a geek. But we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah. It's George's Book of the Week. Walt Disney's It's a Small World, Complete Souvenir Guide, and Behind the Scenes Story. Yet another book to go up for the longest title. I must like the books with the long titles, who knows? Okay, well, this is actually a great booklet, and I say booklet because it's about 28 pages, and it does exactly what the title says. Plus, it is a must for any fan of the attraction or the Imagineers that helped develop it. Um, I'd always assumed that Marty Sklar wrote the book, but it wasn't until I read his uh, theme park biography, I'm not going to call it a Marty Sklar biography, but it's a theme park biography, the one Dream It, Do It, which we reviewed a few shows ago, that he confirmed it was his book. And this is a quote from the book, Dream It, Do It, about the It's a Small World Guide, so it's a little meta, just a little. Uh, this is the, a direct quote. Walt was so proud of the work of uh, the Imagineers' creation for UNICEF, It's a Small World, that he asked me to compose a 28-page booklet saluting their accomplishment. It was called Walt Disney's It's a Small World, the complete souvenir guide and behind-the-scenes story. It turned out so well that it was sold at the Pepsi-Cola-sponsored pavilion. And that's a great little nugget of information because, again, we get confirmation that Sklar wrote the whole thing, but also that Pepsi-Cola did end up selling it, and that's where most of these copies came from, was the 1964 World's Fair. Okay, so it really is a fantastic look at the creation and the development of the ride. The first 14 pages are photos and text that look at the different sections of the vaunted attraction. The photos are exactly what you'd expect from a 1964 publication. They're a little grainy and lack a lot of the detail and focus. The, the text, of course, is more like a travelogue of what you're seeing along your journey. And honestly, the quotes or the captions for the photos are a lot more interesting than some of the text. Uh, Marty also toots his horn some more later in his book with another great quote about it. Uh, and there's another quote. In writing the souvenir booklet, I developed several key phrases that have identified the show in five international Disney parks. He's not proud of that. No, not at all. <laughs> so one of them was join the happiest cruise that ever sailed around the world, a magic kingdom of all the world's children, and the iconic graphic depicting a boatload of children of many cultures and colors flying the colorful flags of various nations was created by graphics designer Paul Hartley to accompany Walt's message in the souvenir guide. And he, he states again, he's so proud. Even today, a blow up of this graphic stands at the entry to every version of this uplifting show. So, no, I'm not knocking what Marty did. You know, he really defined the ride or the attraction itself. But I just, you know, sometimes I think he's a little full of himself. Okay, we're well, moving on, moving on. So the second half of the book is called Behind the Scenes. And that's exactly what it does. It's an interesting look at how the attraction was designed and built. Uh, many Imagineers, now Disney legends, are featured in the photos, but not mentioned by name. We have to remember that Walt still ran the show and was considered the creative genius. It, it does mention, of course, that there were many talented people that helped him work on this, many uh, artists and engineers, but it never really names them. Uh, We've heard so many great stories about the ride and the artists who work on it now that we can sort of piece together who was who and who did what. We do see images of Harriet Burns, Mary Blair, Leota Toombs, and some dude named Rolly Crump. So who knows what that guy was doing. But all of them were working on figures, backgrounds, and other pieces of art for the attraction itself. And it, it's great to read this book and see a story that I've heard Rolly tell that is just you know, mentioned to some artist at the Disney Studios produced some windmills, which sort of gave uh, Walt the idea for some things, but we'll move along. Okay, so this, this really is an expensive book on the secondhand market. If you are into the ride, then it's a worthwhile purchase. 
Also, you know, if you want to see some great behind the scenes images, it's well worth the price as well. And this one is called Walt Disney's It's a Small World, Complete Souvenir Guide and Behind the Scenes Story. What we liked, what we didn't like, yeah, in the booze, 60 Second Review. Okay, so on the last show, we did an actual 60 Second Review, and <laughs> so far, it seems like people enjoyed it. Yeah, not that it was stressful at all. No, No, not for either of us. So (laughs) we're going to do it again, and we're each going to take 60 seconds to review the Blu-ray release of Iron Man 3, which we have both watched and viewed, and uh, I think we have some good things to say about it. But, uh, George, you're going to go first, because I like watching you sweat. (laughs) What, do you got a camera on me? Uh, I may. Oh, okay. I may. All right. This got I'm weird. Right. Okay, we're going to go to the review. That's what I was like. Let's just move on. All right. When I say go, <laughs> I'm going to start my, my timer. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. And go. Well, for starters, when we plugged in the Blu-ray to watch it as a family, the nine-year-old, my nine-year-old is a huge superhero fan. Right off the bat was like, okay, this is so going to be worth it. It's a really long movie, but it is so going to be worth watching it, which I think tells off. 45 you know, seconds. If you can keep a nine-year-old attention, he's going to love it. Thought the film was fantastic. Love the story. Love the change. It's a little bit darker. We see a different side of Tony and some other people. He's grounded a little bit. But the movie is awesome. It's great. Go see it. I love the extras. Ah, Stop. I love the extra. The Agent Carter Marvel feature one-shot was fantastic. Really got some insight into the character and what they're going to do in the future. Uh, The other bloopers were hysterical, and the other... Shorts were well done. See, now I'm panicking because, oh, yeah, I got 15 seconds left. So uh, I give it two thumbs up. My nine year old gives it two thumbs up. I think you should go out and buy it. Yay. You have five seconds left. Anything else you want to say? That's it. No, it's awesome. All right. That was it. it. You panicked me. You said 15 seconds. I'm sorry. What was the point of it? I mean, 60 second review. We did it. Yay. You did it. (laughs) Awesome. Okay. So are you ready? I'm ready whenever you are. Okay. Go. Okay, so I didn't see this movie in the theater, so I was very excited to see it. So I watched it literally this afternoon before we recorded the show. <laughs> watched the movie, watched the, all the extras and everything. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was fantastic. We're seeing Tony Stark in a new light. He kind of has like PTSD from the events in the Avengers. He doesn't know how to deal with himself. He has all these new mixed emotional feelings, and he has all these other things going on at the same time. Um, I, and it really brought it, it brought it kind of back to the bases again, where he lost all of his toys. He has to start from the beginning, and it, it just a really seconds. really good story. Um, I, I really like. There's a twist that came halfway through the movie that I did not see coming, and I thought it was very well done. I'm not going to ruin it. No spoilers here. Forty um, seconds. Great, great, great movie. The extras were fantastic. I loved the deleted scenes. I actually found them more, left. more hilarious than the bloopers that were on the disc. Uh, I liked the making of featurettes. Uh, I liked the part in the the, the people falling out of the airplane. It was all done. Pr- Practically well, well done. Great Five, movie. If you four, love the Marvel stuff, three, definitely go and get just this, this. It's worth it. Un- Boom. Nice. See, I used up my 60 seconds wisely. Gosh, yeah, we'll have, we'll have to, it'll have to be like a 120 second review. Uh, okay, we'll have to get them to change the dude, dude. I just, you know, the, you know, the best thing is the nine year old loved it. What else can you say? Yeah, Everybody exactly. in the family enjoyed it. The so. kids like it, and so do it's I. I like it too. Film. You know, the dogs weren't too excited about it. A little no. too noisy for them. Yeah, that dogs don't seem to like Iron Man. But that's okay. Buy the disc, guys. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. <laughs> okay, so this one's kind of like a... It's a two-part goat. Because you got to go to two different places to kind of get the full thing about it. Like so ten? Ten legs, then? T- yeah, we'll go, we'll go with ten-legged goat, if you will. Sure. Sure, Damn. or maybe two separate five lucky goats. Okay, okay. So, well, actually, you know what? Let's let's start in Adventureland at Disneyland. There's a window there, one of the tribute windows that we usually talk about. That yes. it it offers uh, Oriental tattoos and banjo lessons, but from uh, Professor Harper Goff. Now, of course, Harper Goff was uh, an Imagineer. He also was a famed art director for Walt Disney Productions and Studios. Awesome, awesome stuff. <laughs> um. If you go when you're done at Disneyland, take a little walk over to the Disneyland Hotel, go over to Trader Sam's, have yourself a little drink, and on the wall of Trader Sam's, there is a banjo on the wall. And on the banjo, it's advertising banjo lessons by H. Goff, located at Dock 54, which is actually the building that is in Adventureland. Um, 
advertising the window for the oriental tattoos and the banjo. Anyway, they all tie together. I think that's really cool, and business must be really good if he's advertising in so many places at the same time. <laughs> if he's able to yeah, have that many shingles out, so to speak. So, yes, yes. That's interesting. I wonder if there's anything related to the number 54. Yep. You know, that's so close to the opening of Disneyland, I, I haven't run across anything. I know we both, we looked into it, and we couldn't find anything right off the bat. I mean, we know he designed the Nautilus, and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea came out in 1954, so... Mm-hmm possible reference 80? there, but we're not entirely 80? sure. Yeah, when was he brought into Imagineering? We'll have to look to yeah, see for sure. We'll so if anybody has any ideas, let us know. Send us a message. By playing the banjo. <laughs> or something like that. I don't know where I was going with <laughs> I that. I don't so. know where you were going either. <sighs> I was just going to let you go. Yeah, Roll that's fine. It. That's fine. We will pull this back in and I will thank everybody oh so much for watching and listening to us. Yes, thank you so much. Be sure to leave us a comment and rate us on iTunes. Ah, so that's how they could tell us what the 54 might mean. Yes, exactly, Good. leaving us a comment. Yep, or they could email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com because we love getting emails from people. We it's do, so and we do get quite a bit lately. We have yes. quite a few number of them. Um, you can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly. Let us know there too. Mm -hmm. Great. And always follow us on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Imaginerding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. You can also give us a call on the Communicro Weekly hotline at 424-785-4628. And also remember, call, leave us a message, maybe a comment or a question. If we play it on our mailbag show that we're going to do eventually, we'll send you a a Communicro Communicro Cadet button. I need to learn how to speak. Yeah, I thought you were going to say, I'm a cute Communicore cadet button. I was like, well, that's kind of... Who makes that decision? Uh, I, I guess we do. I, I guess mean, if we're we sending do. them the button, I mean, we they must already... They have to send us a headshot? They have to send an application with a headshot, apparently. Okay. I don't know. Okay, well, Either way, anyways. call, and we'll send you a button. That's what I'm saying. Yes. And don't forget to visit our uh, sponsor for this show, which is the Yesterday, Tomorrow, and Fantasy site. You can see them at yesterday dash tomorrow dash and dash fantasy dot blogspot dot ca or dot com and we've known Corey for years and I've been following his writing on his other blog Voyage is Extraordinaire loves Disney really knows his stuff and uh, I think we both highly recommend it so make sure to check him out it's for serious Disney nerds like us yes, so it is. definitely go check it out it's good stuff there and funny Disney nerds like us yes too. exactly two for one Two for one. Hey, so, okay. Well, for Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. I am.